Hey guys, I'm Hunter, Hunter Cole, and today we're going to be looking at the Camerati Engelmann disease. So, what is Camerati Engelmann disease? Well, it's a rare genetic disorder that a person might have that results in extremely thick bones. That's right, Camerati Engelmann disease is basically extremely thick bones. And it's most prominently on the shafts of bones, but it can also appear at the skull as well. So, how many people have this disease? Well, it's like one person. Okay, it might be a bit more than one person. It's like around 300 cases or a little more worldwide. So, it's a pretty rare disease. What else, though? Well, using self reported statistics, you know, which is a bit of a hairy area, but gives us an idea of maybe the demographics here. We can tell that the majority seem to be female, with around two-thirds of self-reported cases being female, and that most of them are in the Western world. Now, take it with a grain of salt, though, because, you know, it could be that females and those in the Western world are more likely to report themselves with the disease. Okay? So bear that in mind. So what causes Camerati Engelmann disease? Well, it's a TGFB1 gene mutation that results in disease. And this is because the TGFB1 gene creates the TGFB1 protein. And this TGFB1 protein has four main functions in the body. One, proliferation of cells. So it basically tells cells to multiply and by how much. Two, it causes for motility, so basically tells cells where to move and by how much. Three, differentiation, so it tells cells what they should turn into, whether that be an osteocyte or maybe a red blood cell. Okay, And four, it tells cells when to die. So obviously this TGFB1 protein is very, very important to the body. So what this mutation does to the protein is Usually, the protein is off until it's given a signal to turn on. However, the mutation effectively changes this in a way where the protein is constantly on. So the protein will be made in the on state perpetually forever. It is always on. It is always giving commands. It is always telling cells to multiply, to differentiate, all that stuff. And this leads to a lot of problems, but most prominently, the overpromotion of bone growth. Now, unfortunately, this mutation is inherited too. So, if one of your parents have it, best of luck. But yes, it is inherited in a dominant fashion. So, what's affected by this disease? Well, as I said previously before, right? It depends. It does depend. But it's on the shafts of bones, usually, right? The tibia, the femur, the humerus, the ulna, the radius. Those are the things that are most likely to be affected by this disease, okay? And on top of that, the skull can also be affected by this disease. But additional to that, the body fat and muscle tissue in a person can also be affected, and the wound healing and the immune system can also be affected, too. So are the symptoms of this disease. Well, primarily, it's increased bone density of the arms, legs, skull, and hip. And because of that bone density, because of that bone growth, it can result in bone pain. So people will have bone pain with this disease. And additional to that, if the hip forms in a way where it's improperly grown, then it can result into a waddling walk, right? So if the hip is formed in a weird way, they're going to waddle. And, it's, and the excessive bone growth of the legs don't help either. Now, it can, also really, it can also result in decreased muscle mass. And this will result in the physical weakness, right? So if you have less muscle, you're going to be more weak. And it's also going to result in tiredness. So you're going to have less muscle and you're going to have more weight in your bones, which will make you really tired. And on top of that, neurological problems can form with this. So your skull 
will be grown at a rate that is not normal, and this will put pressure on the brain, which will make it not function properly, which will make neurological problems, and a lot of them too, but we're not going to get into that. Scoliosis can also be a symptom of this, and on top of that, contractures, decreased body fat, delayed puberty, weakened immune system, there's a whole host of symptoms that can result from this disease. So how does this even get diagnosed? Well, usually you can just tell. And what I mean by that is you can visually identify this. If you don't believe me, take a look at this picture. Yeah. Yeah, this is what Camerati Engelmann disease does, and it's very visually identifiable in most cases. But if visual identification is not enough, there are other ways to test for it, including x-rays and genetic testing. So you can take an x-ray to analyze just how much bone growth has taken place. And you can use genetic testing on the TGFB1 gene to determine if it has been mutated. Although this is not a foolproof method, as only 90% of people with Camerati Engelmann disease have a mutation at that gene. For the other 10%, it is unknown what causes their disease, but, but in most cases, genetic testing will work for this. So, is there a cure for Camerati Engelmann disease? Unfortunately, no. No, there, there isn't a cure for it. But, there are treatments for it, including anti-inflammatories like corticosteroids and surgical procedures such as a craniotomy. Now, anti-inflammatories are going to help keep inflammation down, and it's going to help reduce pain in people with the disease. And surgical procedures like a craniotomy can be used, especially to relieve pressure from the brain. So what they do in a craniotomy is to just whop off a ton of bone, and because of that loss of bone, the brain will be relieved from a lot of pressure, which will return a lot of neurological functions to that person. So those are the treatments for Camerati Engelmann disease. Well, that's all I have for you. These are my references. And aside from that, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a good day. Bye!